More than a million people are expected to take to the streets of London this weekend for London Pride, a celebration of the LGBT plus community. This year's event marks 50 years since the Gay Liberation Front organised the UK's first Pride March. Our LGBT and identity correspondent, Lauren Moss, has been to meet several members of the group to hear about their fight for equality. It's 1972. The miners' strike first turns off the lights. Ted Heath is Prime Minister. Donny Osmond is top of the pops. And on screen, gay representation looks something like this. Oh, it's the mass stranger. Take my body, but leave my jewels alone. <laughs> Gay people regularly face arrest, and same-sex attraction is still classified as a mental illness. But in the basement of a London university, a revolution is underway and making itself heard in protests across the capital. In July, Pride in the UK is born. That first Pride was about visibility. It was uh, terrifying, daring. I wanted to change the world. To claim public space for queer people. The freedom, the ability to be yourself. We are here, we are queer, and you better get used to it. Having a good time, really. Everybody in long hair, of course, including myself. We were really being very daring coming out in public in the street. It taught me that I was a survivor. We had a mass kissing. Kissing between same-sex couples back then was an arrestable offence. The police were all lined up on the side of the park. Officers did come over and warn us to stop kissing, but there were too many of us. By the time we'd finished snogging each other, one turned round and the police had completely disappeared. Uh, they were so disgusted with what was happening and so powerless. <laughs> After 50 years, some of the original GLF have reunited where it all began, in their old lecture theatre at the London School of Economics. GLF was uh, telling us about coming out and how important it was for us to stand up and uh, be recognised and that we weren't, you know, the, uh, the monsters that uh, the press and, every, and the psychiatrists and everyone else was uh, telling the world we were. I was only... What, 21. I'd left home because my parents disapproved of me being gay. I'd run away and moved in with my girlfriend. I was brought up in India and the whole idea of gayness was not, just not, not in your consciousness. Because back in those days, most LGBT plus people were ashamed and guilty. They were closeted. They dared not show their name in public. In a way, I had no self-worth and I had, been, I had no gay pride or uh, anything like that because I had been hiding who I was. Medical options involved seeing a lot, of, a lot of psychiatrists and convincing them that you were not just mad. I ended up as a drag queen living in a commune in Notting Hill and that was so unexpected but when I got there it made perfect sense. The GLF lit a spark that would burn for the next five decades. But those years also saw huge trials. So don't die of ignorance. When AIDS came along, the partners of the ones who died, the family would sweep in and throw them out of the flat or whatever. It was a time of real despair and bitterness. Uh, we're over that one now with, with um, the recognition of, of gay partnership, because of the civil partnership. Um, and uh, people can't do that to their children anymore. But there was still more fighting to be done after teaching about homosexuality was banned in schools. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. The way that the community came back together over Clause 28 was incredible. The six o'clock news from the BBC. In the House of Lords, a vote is taking place. In the late 1980s, Section 28 protesters stormed the BBC. But then once it was got rid of, yeah, good riddance and a complete and utter waste of time it was. 
Progression came later, steps towards righting the wrongs of the past and equality. Legally, husband... It was a monumental vote to give that equality in terms of the law. We marched for the right to walk down the aisle. Pride has undergone many changes over the years. What started off as a protest of around 700 people is now a march of thousands. But what does it stand for today? There is still a need for protest. It's a fight back, it's a celebration. I would emphasise our history or they'll take it for granted. We have massive issues in terms of international sport that to be seen publicly as gay is a bad thing and damaging, which is astonishing. Even the friends of ours are now being very wary about what can you say, what's respectable enough to say. Gradually, um, they are trying to divide us all up. We need to, um, to join together even more. And shout to wear horse until conversion therapy is banned for all. Still today, a third of all LGBT plus people in Britain have been victims of homophobic, biphobic or transphobic violence. The only way you keep rights is by perpetually struggling to keep them. No victory is ever forever unless you make it forever. The next chapter in the GLF's history will be written on Friday when they march here once again, 50 years after starting a revolution that changed so much for so many. Lauren Moss, BBC News. And you saw him in Lauren's report. I'm joined now by Peter Tatchell, human rights activist and one of the organisers of the first ever parade in London. Um, thank you for your time today and, and um, take us back to that first parade and describe what it was like to be on it. It was incredibly exciting. It had never been done before. Uh, it was a joyful carnival celebration. But we also had a sense of nervousness and anxiety because... We didn't know whether the police would arrest us, and we feared the possibility of being attacked by far-right extremists who did wage violent assaults on the LGBT plus community at that time. But nevertheless, we were undeterred, we were defiant, and we had that march, and we felt so good because just to be out and proud and open, that was a revolution. And the response of the public was a mixture of hostility, yes, a lot of people just gawped in disbelief that gay people would dare show their faces. And many others um, actually supported us. And that gave us confidence and hope. Uh, how different do you think it will be for someone who might be taking part in their first Pride March this weekend? Well, what is extraordinary is that what began as one Pride March in 1972 in London with only 700 people has now exploded this year into over 190 Pride events across the whole of the UK involving a million people. That is extraordinary. I never envisaged that way back in 1972. Uh, so you, you said in the report that there is still a need for protest, but do you think on the whole that, um, that the situation has evolved to an extent where uh, people are, are accepted for who they are who they want to be, who they want to be with, much more now than, than back 50 years ago. Well, absolutely. But you do have to remember that from the 1960s through to the year 2000, there were almost no law reforms at all. We were still treated as criminals and victims of discrimination without any redress. That only began to change in 2000 with the first major reform which ended the ban on LGBT plus in the armed forces. But in the following 13 years, all the anti-gay laws were repealed, finally with same-sex marriage in 2013, an extraordinarily phenomenal pace of change, given that until 1999, Britain had the largest number of anti-gay laws of any country in the world, some of them dating back centuries. Uh, so it has been a huge social revolution. And, of course, the change here, well, and in other countries like the US and so forth, that is not necessarily the case around the world, as our viewers will know. That's right. There are still 69 countries that criminalise same-sex relations, with penalties ranging from a few years' imprisonment right up to life imprisonment. And, sadly, there are still 12 Muslim-majority countries that have the death penalty. Gay people can be put to death 
simply because of who they love. Uh, it's been reported that um, you're saying that police, in uniform at least, um, shouldn't have a place at the Pride Parade until they respect the community. I is that a sweeping generalisation to say that? I think there's a big problem with the police. Um, the police have been exposed in this year alone having big problems with homophobia, racism and misogyny. You know, we know they mishandled uh, the Stephen Port serial killers investigation where four young gay men were murdered. Uh, we know that um, they behaved very disgracefully over the Sarah Aver Everard vigil. And we know that um, police stop and search uh, victimized the champion black athlete, Bianca Williams. These are just typical examples of problems with the police. So what I'm saying is that uniform police are not welcome in the Pride Parade. But of course, there are many good officers and I thank and praise them. And they're welcome to march in civilian clothes, but not the police as an institution until they reform. Uh, Peter Tatchell, thank you very much for your time today.